Dot, when he opened up the first service like this, I think I might leave now, actually. Thanks a lot, brother. But humility is a great place to preach from. Good morning. It is good to see everybody here. Raise your hand if you were one of the men on the men's retreat. Man, that was an awesome retreat. You guys saw it all? At all? A little bit from the workout? Yeah, it was, that was great. Martin fed us like kings. My goodness. The tacos were so good, we all broke out in tongues together last night. And then RC, what a job in leading us in uh, worship. Thank you so much for that. Great. If you were a man not able to go on that retreat and they do it again next year, I would highly encourage you to go. I came to be served, but man, uh, I was served myself. I was stabbed actually in the heart several times by the messages, but it was good. It was good for the soul. So thank you, Ronnie. I don't think he's here right now. And, and Billy for leading that. If you would not mind opening up to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and uh, standing to your feet as I read the text for today. I actually preached from 2 Corinthians 4 a few moments ago, but I feel like I should go to 2 Corinthians 2 for this message. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and if you would stand to your feet, I'm going to read verses 12 through, I'm sorry, verses 14 through 17. The Apostle writes, but thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, and to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God and the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And all God's people said, hey, let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of worshiping you openly and freely this morning. And I ask that you would show us what you want us to see in this text of scripture so that we walk out change from one level of glory to another. Lord, our hope is in you. Would your spirit move powerfully in our hearts for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can grab a seat. Now, I just want to encourage you to talk back to me. I preach in Detroit. Well, I did up until recently. I'm in a time of transition in an old post office, inner city Detroit, and people talk back to me when I preach. And I don't, I don't always like what they say, but at least I know they're there, Okay. So you can talk back to me, but we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and if you know anything about 1 and 2 Corinthians, you know the Apostle Paul had a rather rocky relationship with the church at Corinth. He's having to correct them. Now, don't get it twisted. He actually loves the church big time, even praises them profusely. But my man is burned to the marrow of his bone over the bad Living that's going on at the church, that's called um, not having orthopraxy, but living bad, and the bad doctrine that's going on. They didn't have orthodoxy. And, and, and the thing that really was, was just kind of welling up a lot of emotion in his gut is this. As he tried to correct them, did they say, thank you, sir, for correcting us? Thank you for pastoring us? What did they do? They said, no, man, we got it straight. We don't need to listen to you. And so he's deeply burdened that they're not responding to his correction. Now, the slide away from orthodoxy, fancy way to say right doctrine, and the slide away from orthopraxy, fancy way to say right living, was fueled by a deadly dynamic that is just as prevalent today, namely an insatiable infatuation with the world's approval. Anybody feel that? An intense craving for cultural acceptance. Anybody feel that at school or at work? A driving obsession with being liked by everyone, coupled with an unwillingness to use the words of Hebrews to go outside the camp, go outside the gate and bear the reproach that Christ did. And that in the last few years particularly, has thrown the door wide open 
for undermining the authority of Scripture in general and the sufficiency of the gospel in particular. And maybe we could recount stories of Christians and churches and Christian schools and Christian organizations that are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, buying all kinds of malarkey and nonsense, coated with just enough Bible to make them seem palatable to those who want to sound compassionate but are utterly lies. Now, I think that our text is like a deep rudder to, in a ship that gives that ship stability in turbulent seas. This, this text has God-glorifying, kingdom-advancing, backbone-building, loss-reaching, grace-stripping, difference-making backbone. All of that to set up the big idea. Here's the big idea. If you want to smell good to everyone, you will do no real good for anyone. Does that make sense? Because I hope in about 25 minutes, don't set your watch, it will make sense. If you want to smell good to everyone, you will do no guilt, good, real good for anyone. Or to put it positively, you've got to be willing to stink to some people to salvifically do good to other people. And so to mark our trek, our walk through this text, there's three flags I'm going to put down. First of all, there's going to be a visual illustration. Second of all, there's going to be an olfactory illustration. Anybody know what olfactory means? You're looking at me like, dude, looking at you, I don't think you know what the word means either. I didn't until recently, okay, all right? If you go, you got the essence of olfactory, uh, uh, an aroma, if you will, a smelling illustration, okay? So a visual illustration an olfactory illustration, and then finally a rhetorical question that does demand a resounding answer. Y'all with me? A.B., you with me? All right, let's go. First of all, verse 14, there is a visual illustration. This visual illustration paints the, a, a, a shocking picture that highlights that if you are in Jesus Christ, if you have turned from your sins and trusted Christ, you are part, my brother, my sister, you're part of an, of an unstoppable victory march that cannot be defeated. You are on the winning side, is the point of this first illustration. In other words, as you proclaim Christ crucified for our sins and his bodily resurrection, as you're open and honest about all the biblical categories of sin that required him to come and die for us, as you seek to live out the newness of life God has saved you to, you join a victorious victory march, and Paul draws on a shocking word picture to make this very point. Verse 14, he says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us, now read those next two words, in... Now, Texans are always boasting about how great their state is, okay? So you can read with me, can't you? I know you can do this, come on. In triumphal what? You got to say it with some Texas swag right here. Leads us in what? Oh, come on, Leo. I'm going to have to have you stand up and lead them in this. In triumphal procession. Highlight that. Circle that. Underline that. That is referring to an ancient Roman practice of holding a parade through the streets of Rome, a highly organized, choreographed, planned parade through the streets of Rome for a victorious general and his army. Now, three criteria, on ha criteria had to be met in order to hold such a parade. Number one had to be absolute, overwhelming, crushing defeat of the enemy. Like a, like a total shutout. Number two, there had to be total and complete submission by the survivors of the enemy after the combat. Like they were prisoners of war. And third of all, the general who led them in victory could be the only officer on the ground who led that combat operation. And if those three criteria were met, they would hold what was called a triumphal procession. And dude, this was a big, big deal. It's going to be bigger than the Super Bowl parade we're going to hold in Detroit this coming February as we finally get a Super Bowl, okay? Or maybe the Texans. Or if you're part of the cowboy cult, I'm sorry, maybe, okay. But like, it, it's like a Super Bowl parade on steroids. Big time deal. And here's how it would work out. 
You had like seven components. First off, you had the senate, the ancient Roman senators and statesmen. Politicians yesterday, just like today, want to be up front and get all the credit. They'd be the front of this triumphal procession. Then, right behind them, you would have legions of trumpeteers blowing their trumpets, blaring, making all kinds of music and noise on the parade route. Then third, behind them, you had the enemy POWs, the, the survivors who were captured. They'd be shackled in chains, they'd be on carts and wagons, all looking all raggedy, defeated, and they were, well, the fourth group behind them were a squad of special soldiers whose job at the end of the parade was to execute the POWs before the citizens of Rome. I told you this is a shocking illustration. Then, fifth of all, you would have priests waving incensors up and down the parade route so incense would be billowing smoke everywhere. And then sixth of all, you had the general himself, the victorious general. He'd be in all kinds of a military regalia, dressed purple with a halo over his head as a god, nod to the god of Jupiter. He would be led in a a uh, uh, chariot that sometimes pulled by horses or stallions, and one time I read even lions. He would have his family and his cabinet and all that with him. And then behind him, the seventh component, the most massive component, was wave of troops after wave after troops, archers and swordsmen and cavalry and all the rest. Massive parade. And what they would do is they'd form up at a place called Campus Martius, a couple of miles outside the city of Rome at 0 dark 30 in the morning. They would begin then as the light would break across the city to slowly, methodically make their way through the city to the heart of the city to the capital, the capital district. The streets would be lined with citizens jeering the uh, prisoners, cheering the victorious troops. They would line the parade route, all miles and miles of parade route, with flowers over which they would walk. And you just, just imagine, if you can, this scene. Imagine, imagine um, the sounds, the trumpets blaring, right? The crowds cheering, the feet marching. Then imagine, if you can, the sight. The, 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 the New Day sun glistening on the armor of the troops and then seeing the incense billowing all across this parade route. And then imagine the smell. What would you smell during this parade? Well, you would smell, and this is significant for this text, the, the aroma emitted by the crushed flowers and the aroma of the swinging incense. It was, if you could just picture this in Dolby Surround Sound, Technicolor, a stunning scene demonstrating in every way overwhelming victory. Do you see that? And God says, through Paul, Christ leads us in triumphal procession. Christ leads us in this. God leads us. Some argue, now here's the question. Where is Paul placing himself in this triumphal procession? And by extension, you and I, who are likewise believers in Jesus Christ. Some would say Paul is putting himself among the POWs, the one being marched to their death. After all, does not the mission of Christ advance by sacrifice, right? Are we not all called to die for Christ? And while all of that is true, I don't think that's where Paul's placing him or us by extension. There's lots of reasons, I don't have time to cover it all, but I think that he actually is placing us in the victorious troops. Because, is not the Bible full of paradoxes? For instance, in Romans 8, we're counted as sheep to be slaughtered all the day long, and yet it goes on to say, yet we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I think Paul is placing us in the triumphant army, that as you walk with Christ, in your life, here in 2024, joining the legions of saints behind us, you are part of an unstoppable siege. Did not Jesus say in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? I want you in your mind's eye to go to one of the most stunning scenes in Revelation chapter 5. Do you remember that scene? In Revelation chapter 5, my favorite, one of my favorite passages in the Bible there's a picture of, of, of John 
and there's a scroll there. And John begins to weep, does he not? Remember that? Why does John begin to weep in Revelation 5? Because great state of Texans. Because why? There's no one worthy to open the scroll. And so John begins to weep. Let me do a little sanctified side trail right here, rabbit trail. Man, it's okay to cry sometimes. Man who always cry, you probably got an issue. A man who never cries about things that are cry worthy might have issues as well. He begins to weep. And then this one elder swoops in an angelic being. And what does an angelic being say? Weep no more. Why? For the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered and overcome, and he is able to take the seal and open the scroll. Right? And that scroll represents the title deed of history and the unfurling and the outplaying of history. The point of that text is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the victorious general leading this uh, in this triumphal procession. And if you're in Christ, you're there. You're there. I know life can seem tough. You get hit with relational difficulties, physical difficulties, financial difficulties. You're trying to be faithful at work and sharing your faith, and you screw up. You say stuff you shouldn't say. You do something you shouldn't do. And you're like, how can I be any part of victory? I think I got a big L over my head right now. You ever feel that way? Play the long game, baby. You're part of a victorious army. Not because you're all that. You're a chump just like me, saved by grace. But because of King Jesus, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. And by the way, in that Revelation 5 passage, it says that uh, the, the elders who cast their crowns before the throne have bowls, and the bowls are full of incense, and the incense is the prayers of the saints. You know what that tells me? That our prayers make a difference in the outcome of human history. So keep praying, even if you're not seeing the result, because your prayers are incense before the throne of God above. And then they break out in a song that if you had supersonic ears would be on the top ten, ten playlist of heaven. They cry, worthy are you, for you were slain. And by your blood, you purchased people from every nation, tribe, kindred, and tongue. So hey, listen, be of good cheer. God's purpose is going to utterly triumph even if you can't see it right now, even if you can't feel it right now, the lamb will have the full reward of his suffering. Point being, stick to the stuff. Stand on the truth. Stay with the word. Right. And I'd be remiss if I did not ask you this question. Where actually and functionally, to stretch this metaphor a little bit more of triumphal procession, where are you in this triumphal procession are you still a slave to sin being led to your eternal execution i know that shocking imagery but it is a shocking image right or have you come to see i am a sinner who sinned with a high hand against a holy god who must judge my sin but praise God, he placed my sin on the cross and I have believed that and I have received Jesus and he has come into my life and he has made me new. Is that true for you? Has that happened to you? Amen. Listen, if that's true for you, we are victorious warriors oh, yeah. and warriorettes. That's who we are. But let us be happy warriors. No, don't be jerk for Jesus, okay? Enough of them out there. Let's be happy warriors because we've been saved by grace and we know the outcome. I must quote at this point before I go to point two, Jim Harbaugh. Thank you for reminding me of the game yesterday, but that's okay. Jim Harbaugh for the Michigan fans, he used to coach Michigan, now he coaches in the NFL. Yes, he was a quarterback, yes, and a pretty good one too. Rose Bowl back in the 80s. Last year, he was asked this about his team, and we won the national championship. The national championship. Did I say that loudly enough? <laughs> Last year. And he said, we're on a mission, Detroit Free Press, but we are on a happy mission. Can I say how much more that should be true for you and I as followers of Jesus Christ? We are on a mission, but we are on a happy mission. So... 
Visual illustration number one, a shocking picture. You are part of a glorious, unstoppable victory march. You with me? Amen. Number two, the olfactory illustration. Go like this. Hopefully the person next to you bathed in the last uh, week or so as she did that. But this olfactory illustration illustrates that you and I are, if, if you're part of this victorious victory march, you are a two-sided odor. Say that with me, two-sided odor. And I'm not talking about your left armpit and your right armpit, okay? So stay with me on this. What this illustration, this olfactory illustration represents is that there are two very different, two very divergent responses to the very same messages. You notice, message, this verse talks about two different smells. He says, for we are the aroma, verse 15, of Christ, to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. He amplifies this, verse 16, to the one of fragrance from death to death, maybe your version translates it a stench from death to death, and to the other a fragrance from life to life. Now, two different, very different smells. Let me, let me, let me start with... Um, the fragrance or stench of death. Can you think of the worst thing you've ever smelled in your life? I know you're going to go get ready to eat lunch, so we don't want to be too vivid right here. But um, I, I live in inner city Detroit. But they call me an urban redneck because I love the deer hunt. And uh, <laughs> to give you an illustration of my redneckness coming out, I think, is one time we were coming back from a deer hunt, an unsuccessful deer hunt, but what did I see on the side of the road driving home? But a freshly struck doe that for non-deer hunters is a female deer. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Even though we didn't score while well, we were actually hunting, man, this deer is, looks like it's freshly struck. And like every good urban redneck, I take the, my knife out of my glove box and I cut. I begin to cut out the back straps. And the minute I punctured that hide, Whoo, that was not a freshly struck doe, let me tell you. It was the most noxious odor ever. I'm still trying to get the odor out of my nostril hairs some seven years later. I'm telling you, it was nasty. It was a nasty smell. Or I think of being in Operation Restore Hope in Somalia, Africa, back in 96, 94. And uh, Somalia, Mogadishu at least, had no sanitation system. So the sewage you saw on the side of the road is the sewage that goes through the pipes of your house, okay? And that smell in that intense Houston-like heat was utterly overwhelming. But perhaps the worst smell is this. I, I like to work out to maintain my eating habit. Okay, I got to burn some calories because I know I'm going to chow down later. And because I'm conscious about my wife's workload, because I work out every day and I get my sweatshirt soaked, I'm like, I can't just wash a, have her wash a sweatshirt every day. I'll hang it up on a hook and I'll wear it two, three, four, five, six days in a row. Yeah, I know, that's kind of nasty. So a while back, I'm going for a workout. I don't know, I was on day four, day five, maybe day six of that sweatshirt. And I went to hug her and give her a kiss goodbye and she stiff armed me like a fullback. She wouldn't even give me a fist bump. She said, dude, you smell, get away from me. That's what bad odors do, don't they? They repel you. They say, get away, I don't want that smell. Those are bad odors. Now, how about good odors? Can you think of some good odors? Flowers. What's that? Flowers. flowers, yes. We're going to come back to flowers in just a second, too. If you've been to Detroit, there's southwest Detroit, and there's a place called Taqueria El Rey. And it, well, I thought they were really good tacos until I had yours, Martin. But man, I mean, known in Detroit, they just burned down last year, so we can't go there anymore. Best tacos ever. Or I think of my wife, speaking of deer hunting, venison, um, um, well, her venison jerky, but also her venison, uh, not meatloaf, man, a shepherd's pie. She puts a venison twist on this Irish dish that... Um, it will get you speaking in multiple tongues at once. It's that good, okay? Trust me. Or just her, her homemade apple pie. Now, I'm going somewhere with all this, okay? Just so bear with me. 
in these examples, you have two different things, right, producing two different smells. Whether it's the overused sweatshirt or the not-so-fresh dough on the side of the road or Mogadishu sanitation system non-existent, bad smell, or here, Takiri El Rey or the apple pie or, or, the, or the venison shepherd's pie. But in our text, now come, stay with me on this, okay, the very same thing smells two different ways, right? Now, what is the very same thing? That smells two different ways. Who is that? You got to get the weight and freight of this. He says, we, we, you and I, as we bear this good news, we're going to smell two different ways to two different groups of people. Do you see that? To those who are being saved, who want to hear the message of salvation, we're going to smell like the fragrance of life. But to those who don't want anything to do with the Lord... Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with being saved. We will smell like the stench of death. Going back to the first illustration, what did they smell on this parade route? The crushed, what? Flowers and the burning incense. What did that smell like to the people there? And the answer is, depends who they were. If you were in the third element, or the second element, whatever it was, if you were an enemy POW being led to your death there at the center of the city, what do you think those crushed flowers would have smelled like? Death. death. A reminder, they were marching to their execution. But if you were part of the victorious army or the citizens lining the parade route, what did that smell like to you? Ah, victory, right? Like, we won. It was, vic it was a smell of victory. So, what's the point? You have to get comfortable with the reality that if you're going to be faithful to God and faithful to the gospel, you will smell terrible to some and wonderful to others. The same message born by the same person, lived out by the same person, person will smell two different ways. And that requires sacrifice. So it does require sacrifice. You must be willing to sacrifice what people say about you. And in some places, and I believe it's coming here quicker than we realize, sacrifice even what people do to us. And for now, you must be willing to weather the mischaracterizations, the slander against you, the stereotypes against you. You must swallow the epithet, swallow the slander, eat, eat that, blow it off. All that stuff that's hurled at you. I, I remember Jaylene Hinkle. Any soccer fans here? Jaylene Hinkle played for the U.S. Women's National Team, um, and she actually plays pro soccer now, although I think she might have retired. But when she was 17 or 18, they called her up to the national team. And, like, that's something that you work for your whole life if you're in the soccer circuit, like, to get to the actual full national women's team. Only, she was called up for a three-game exhibition series, I think it was overseas. And when she got there, she found out that they were requiring the players to wear rainbow jerseys to advertise, you know, pride. And she's a wonderful young woman. She, she doesn't spew out hate or anything that, like that, but she loves the Lord. And she knows what the Bible says about that. And so she graciously said, listen, can I practice with a team, but I can't suit up for the games because I can't endorse something that I know is against God. What do you think they said to her? Well, thank you for being so open about that. Thank you for being so gracious and saying that. What did they say about her? They called her every name in the book, right? Phobe this and this and that. And yet she was willing to stink to some to smell good to others. You should look up that story. It's a powerful story. Listen, if we don't embrace our two-sided, here's the illustration, our two-sided smell, our two-sided old factoriness, what we will do is simply this. We will succumb to the temptation to shape the message we bear in order not to smell so bad, right? We'll water down the truth. We won't be faithful. And I just want to remind us that trying to smell good for everyone will make you no real good for anyone. 
in verse 17 talks about such people. Such people are peddlers of God's word. He says, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. A peddler is somebody who instead of God's word using them, they use God's word for personal gain. In the commercial realm, a peddler was somebody who would dilute their wine with extra water and yet say, oh, this is pure wine. Or someone who would uh, adulterate their gold with inferior metals and say, hey, this is pure gold. It's not hard to see what the application here is. There are people who distort and dilute the truth, maybe not for gain of personal money, but for gain of acceptance with your friends, gain of praise of the world. And that is the very same tactic Satan employed in the Garden of Eden many years ago when he said, did God really say? Do you really have to take it that literally? Does it really, do you have to really take it that way? Come on, get with it. Get with the times. And with this demonic hermeneutic, Christians are bowing down to new sexual ethics, right? This is real quiet right here. They're, they're, they're bowing down to the gender craziness and pronoun craziness. Anybody have any pressure with that? And let me just give you just, again, another sanctified rabbit trail right here. The pronoun game. I can't call somebody a pronoun that they're not. Why can't I do that? Because I'm, I'm not called to bear false witness, Right? It's false witness, isn't it? I'm not the bare false witness. So I'm not going to be unkind. I'm going to be uh, I'll explain. But I, listen, I can't break the commandment of lying, right? And yet people are bowing down to that. They're bowing down to the latest repackaged version of racism called CRT. They're bowing down to the modern day holocaust of abortion and on and on and on. And what the world does with Christians who capitulate there and compromise there, they say, bravo, bravo, that's my kind of Christian. And if the world is applauding you, I'm pretty sure God isn't. Right? So, you have to be willing to stink the sum that you might salvifically smell good to others and do good to them and bring them good news. So finally, we then have this rhetorical question. Who is sufficient for these things? This is how he puts it. He says, this is a really hard thing you're calling me to. Who is sufficient for these things? And the answer is, who is? No one is in our own strength. A loud resounding, no one is. But listen, going back to the top of the text as we close, God is sufficient as he works through us. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads who? Us in triumphal procession. I love sharing this quote. It's like, I overuse it, but it's so good, I don't mind overusing it. I kick this dead dog all the way home. Faithfulness belongs to us, and fruitfulness belongs to God. And he spells it out real plainly when he gives us three aspects of what this faithfulness is. Instead of being peddlers of God's word, as we just looked at, we, first of all, as men of sincerity, faithfulness means we are men and women who speak sincerely of God, that is, truthfully of God, with both our lips and our lives. Then he goes on to say, as commissioned by God, we not only speak truthfully of God, we speak boldly for God. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're ambassadors for Christ, right? Paul literally says, God, my friends, is speaking through me to you. Be reconciled to me. We speak boldly for God as we speak truthfully for him. And then finally, he says, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. We do so, in other words, with a recognition that I am always in the presence of the great I am. I'm always before the one who is and was and is to come. We speak, therefore, consciously in the presence of God. We must, listen, we must live and proclaim and share in view of that great day when we stand immediately before the one we live before 24-7 right now. And I want you to think of that day when you stand before the king. Every other thing that you ever bow down to will be like this, right? So let's live like that right now. 
Martin Luther has a famous quote, and I end with this. If I profess with loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth except that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady in the battlefield everywhere else, except there, is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at the point of controversy. Martin Luther. In other words, you can say, well, I'm faithful to everyone else, everywhere else, but am I faithful where the battle is being raged right now? And you don't need much Greek. You don't need much... Uh, Deep stuff to understand where the controversy lay. So be faithful. Stick to the stuff. Remember, you are part of a victorious victory march. Be willing to embrace your two-sided odor. And you do so through the sufficiency, not of yourself, but the sufficiency of God. Brothers and sisters, don't let your own odors get in the way, okay? Be kind, gracious, charitable, and all that. But be willing to stink to some that you may salvifically do good to others. Amen? Amen? Thank you so much for the privilege to let me preach to you. It has been a great blessing. I love you, Acts Community Church.